Hello, my name is Sarah McCaffrey and I'm the manager of interdisciplinary arts at Asia Society. Thank you for joining Hacking the Syllabus, Critical Solidarities with Nadine Neighbor and Elisa Bieria. It feels vital given that we're discussing building critical solidarities that in the process of doing so, that we honor each of us who are a part of tonight's gathering. So I want to warmly welcome each of you. I understand that we're operating within the frames of this virtual space, but within this, we want this event to feel as engaging as possible. So we encourage your participation and welcome you to join in the conversation via the chat if you're logged into the webinar or if you're watching live from Facebook or YouTube via the comments. So to get us warmed up, I'll start by asking us all a question so we can do a kind of collective virtual mapping. And my question is, where are you all joining in from? Asia Society New York is situated on the Lenape Island of Manhattan in Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland. We pay respect to the Lenape peoples and also acknowledge that New York City has been a gathering spot and home for other indigenous peoples. So tonight's program is organized as a part of the inaugural Asia Society Triennial, which comprises the exhibition, We Do Not Dream Alone, and a series of performances and programs. Tonight's event is also part two of the three-part series, Hacking the Syllabus, Critical Solidarities, which shares both perspectives and resources on building intersectional solidarities. The resource that's connected to tonight's event is Nadine's syllabus from her class, Feminism and Social Change. So this syllabus is currently up on Asia Society's website and will live there as a resource. Tonight, Nadine will give a lecture related to this syllabus, which will be followed by conversation with Elisa Bieria, and at the end, we'll take questions from the audience for a Q&A session. I'm honored to introduce our speakers for tonight. Dr. Nadine Neighbor is an award-winning author, speaker, and activist on women of color and transnational anti-imperialist feminisms and Arab and Muslim feminisms. She is a professor in the Gender and Women's Studies Program and the Global Asian Studies Program at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and author and co-editor of five books. She is a co-founder of MAMAS, which we'll hear more about later, and founder of Liberate Your Research Workshops. Dr. Elisa Bieria is an assistant professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Riverside. She is developing a manuscript entitled Missing in Action, Agency, Race, and Invention, which explores how in Intentional action is socially imagined in contexts of anti-Black racism, carceral cultures, and gendered violence. She co-founded Survived and Punished, a national organization that challenges the criminalization of survivors of domestic and sexual violence. We're incredibly excited to have Nadine and Elisa participate in this three-part series. Their discussion teaches us about the power and creativity that can emerge when two people have shared histories of coalitional feminists of color organizing along with profound forms of friendship and solidarity together. And with that, I will pass it over to Nadine for her lecture. Thank you so much, Sarah. You've just worked so hard on this event and I, I've really never seen an event organized so well. Um, just so grateful to you and to Asia Society for inviting Elisa and I tonight to be with you. I'm just gonna jump right into it. Uh, I'll be speaking about the radical potential of mothering uh, and my research began my thinking about mothering of course began you know many years ago, but. I started thinking about it more deeply when I was participating in, uh, just do my screen share, forgot to do that, sorry about that. Uh, I'm also reading from paper, so you might hear some crumpling a bit, uh, hopefully not though. Uh, and hopefully you could see the 
screen. Uh, let me just open the chat in case there are any issues. So just let me know in the chat if anybody has any issues with my presentation, tech, tech issues. <laughs> um, so my research began in 2013 while participating in the Egyptian revolution that began in 2011. Uh, I was in Egypt starting in 2013 off and on working with a coalition of 13 feminist organizations in Egypt. And that revolution uh, entailed basically 17 million people taking the streets to overthrow their ruthless dictator. Uh, unfortunately, it was an unfinished revolution. It was a US-backed authoritarian dictatorship that, that was sustained for 30 years uh, through US-backed militarism and structures of containment and punishment. From the CIA's secret prisons and extraordinary rendition to excessive policing and incarceration of activists or any dissident, all of which rely upon sexualized violence. Um, uh, it's an unfinished revolution that continues today, um, but with a crackdown uh, in the form of an extreme neo-fascist counter-revolution. Um, I've written about this recently in Truth Out, uh, so I won't be able to talk more about the Egyptian revolution, but I will just get right into my research. So while reflecting on the links between gender violence and policing in Egypt, I began considering all the ways mothering was essential to the revolution. So the Egyptian state relied on, and this is a bit of a trigger warning, virginity testing and denuding of women protesters to government backed mob based sexual assaults to quell resistance. Um, the state used heteropatriarchal nationalist ideas of family and mothering, such as the idea that a woman belongs in the home as a homemaker and caregiver, first and foremost, and not in the streets. And this entailed conflating protesting with sexual deviance, equating prostitution and protesting. Um, so that was a tactic used to quell the revolution. Then the global corporate media sensationalized images of mothers and children in Tahrir Square to underscore the point that, you know, this was like when the US media was painting the Egyptian revolution as if, oh, wow, you know, Arabs actually can be fighting for democracy. So they sensationalized this idea of like the civil society taking the streets with these images that even mothers were there. So the underlying idea there is that even subjects most unpolitical, most disconnected from public space and most closely connected to domestic reproductive labor, that is mothers, even they took to the streets. Revolutionary leftists also sentimentalized mothering by sensationalizing mothers of the martyrs brutally killed by the Mubarak regime. The message here is that the ultimate icon of human suffering, the grieving mother is the grieving mother, as if the suffering of the mother is unlike any other. And one more discourse I'll add to the map um, of the discourses that, you know, heteropatriarchal or discourses that constrain mothering, uh, definitions of mothering. Another discourse is conventional feminist discourses, especially white liberal feminism that interprets mothering as an unfairly gendered burden that confines women to a depoliticized heteropatriarchal private sphere. So in that analysis, mothering can only be oppressive. So together, all of these discourses reify the sanctity of motherhood in one way or another, normalizing the conflation between domesticity, reproductive labor, and femininity. And here, um, the idea here is that mothering is an extension of biological children. Uh, mothers related to resistance and revolution are not fighters for justice, even if they were you know, in Tahrir Square, they're still a mother first foremost and finally, as if mothering and revolutionary activism is an oxymoron. So while working with organizations like the Women and Memory Forum in Egypt to document women's contributions to the revolution, I noticed a pattern. Most of the women we had interviewed were mothering while protesting and nothing about their lives or activism aligned with any of the discourses I just outlined. I found mothering in the revolution 
where it was o- not only that women refused to allow their revolutionary labor to be sidelined by mothering, but also that their mothering wall protesting was constituted by a radical potential to disrupt a primary boundary that sustained the authoritarian regime. I won't get too much into that research because actually today I want to link up that research with my work in Chicago around mothering for the purposes of abolition. But as far as the Egypt research goes, whether it was expanding reproductive labor beyond biological mothering, um, or whether it was that everyone in Tahrir Square was participating in mothering forms of labor, like feeding each other, keeping each other warm, um, doing all the care work and medical care work needed to keep the sit-in at Tahrir Square alive, which is what we saw at Standing Rock. Nadine? Oh, yes. Nadine, I'm so sorry. Can you, this is Elisa. Um, The paper rustling is uh, distracting. Okay, thank you so much. So sorry to interrupt. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'll have to look away if that's okay, just for a moment. So, um, so yes, yeah, so the idea here is that mothering forms of labor in, in various contexts of resistance and revolution are essential to keeping sit-ins alive and protest alive, um, although that labor is all often invisibilized. Um, also in Egypt, women who were mothering small children and couldn't leave their home contributed to the revolution in urgent ways through social media, and in some cases provided thousands of activists with internet access when the regime shut it down. So in the meantime, black women of color and decolonizing feminisms provided me with lenses for exploring how mothering and resistance um, are not at all conflictual. Um, and, and allowed me and and helped me in thinking about this theme of mothering while protesting. So I use, um, so if sentimentalizing mothering means that mothering is merely a symbolic identity that supports the militarized nation state, I propose that we unsentimentalize mothering in order to explore its radical potential within the context of revolution, abolition, decolonization and anti-militarism. So this moves me to Chicago. So the the project in Egypt had to stop because of the counter-revolution. And I moved the project to Chicago. um, And uh, after, so after 20 years of thinking through the intersections of feminist prison abolition with anti-imperialism and feminist decolonization through frameworks that I learned from people like Elisa Bieria um, when we organized together in Insight, um, the, a movement of many movements, a coalitional feminist of color movement that we worked um, together in in the early 2000s, which um, really helped us think together about how the military shares resources and technology with police and border control, how containing people in prisons extends to controlling the borders of the United States um, and caging children and how that intensifies and contributes to solidifying the borders of the US nation and strengthening the US nation state's domination of native lands and people. So all of those kind of intersectional, coalitional, feminist of color framings are kind of the thinking that undergirds the project that I'll be talking with you about now around radical mothering in Chicago. So the project um, radical mothering in Chicago, oh, here are some images about, you know, women led chants in Tahrir Square before I go on that I wanted to share with you. Sorry, I'm jumping a bit um, around uh, that what I was saying earlier is that I spoke to so many of these women and also worked with them uh, as an activist. And then it dawned on me that so many of them were were people who were protesting while mothering. So these are just some of those images that I I forgot to show you. So now to the project in Chicago that, you know, the thinking of it again, grew out of my work with Insight and um, through thinking through with Elisa Bieria and so many other people who were part of that movement. Um, so the, the, 
this so I'm going to share with you one part of this project and uh, the, the project is called Mamas. It's a collective founded by several people, myself, Janae, um, Janae Strong and Suzanne Nasser. And we are working with and, and supporting uh, people who are mothering within the undocumented struggle, Palestinian liberation, prisons and policing, um, and uh, indigenous struggle in Chicago. Um, and thinking about what, how could those movements look differently if we thought about them through the lens of radical mothering? What does radical mothering bring to these movements? The project, as you can see, has many components, many people are involved in it, and it has many subgroups and projects. And I'm going to be sharing with you the one project called Mothers of the Kidnapped. And this is a collective that named themselves Mothers of the Kidnapped. And they are Black and Latinx mothers of police torture survivors. So that is the hundreds of folks in Chicago who were forced into making confessions and were incarcerated as a result of those coerced confessions that came out of a situation of police torture, um, physical and mental um, health, mental torture, uh, psychological torture. Um, now, um, what the collective does, Mothers of the Kidnapped, is it works to amplify the voices of the people who are mothering torture survivors. And we work to amplify their voices in activism, policy, and the media. So before I go on, I'll just say that I define mothering as caring activities that have historically been gendered as feminine, while affirming such work is not performed exclusively by those recognized as women or biologically related to those receiving the care. So here are just a few images from the project that we can discuss later in the, uh, in the discussion time. These are examples of op-eds that some of the mothers of the kidnapped have written as a result of our a collective. And here is us, um, a one group um, of the mothers of the kidnapped, one photo. Um, we participate in various coalitions in Chicago around COVID-19 in prisons and jails, and we make sure that these mothers have a seat at the table, press conferences. Um, and so the project theorizes um, radical mothering through a research methodology that's embedded in social movements in Chicago, um, especially abolitionist social movements for this project. And our working group, um, well, I'll just skip a bit here to say that one idea that um, circulates, um, that has been circulating more and more is that abolitionist movements really, the idea of uplifting care work and, you know, what do we mean by building an alternative society? Um, what kinds of caring, what kinds of safety, what are the strategies um, we're going to use for transforming this society and the United States and, and creating something different? through themes like you know, what Dean Spade talks about, reciprocity and solidarity. Others talk about collective love. Uh, Mariam Kaba talks about the discipline of hope. Um, all uh, strategies for creating safety, security, dignity, survival, joy, and, and so much more. You know, what are the values we wanna uplift when we think about you know, that other, other world, the future that we want? Um, and within that though, what our project uh, illustrates is that people who have been mothering while trapped in the prison industrial complex have already been, you know, practicing these, um, they are models for us of how we can think about these, um, now what's become more, I don't know, trendy concepts of collective care work. Um, and so when we think about that, you know, the, 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 the folks in our project have been doing care work um, in relation to abolition for decades, um, but all along their labor, their visions, their strategies tend to remain invisible. Um, and that's partly because of the heteropatriarchal structures of many social movements. Now, when we think about uh, mother survivors, um, we use the word mother survivors. Oh, and I'll also say that it's not only heteropatriarchal social movements, it's also that society tends to mother shame these folks for quote unquote, raising criminals. They're the people who raise the murderers and the rapists, right? So there's this idea of like mothers of incarcerated people as the people we should blame 
right? And that's according to like the carceral state's logic. And, and you know, the state of Israel does the same thing with Palestinians, blaming Palestinian mothers for, you know, Palestinian resistance that gets redefined as quote unquote terrorism. Um, and so when we think also about the prison industrial complex also dehumanizes people who are mothering incarcerated people in every single interaction they have. They are targeted by the security guards, by the police officers, dehumanized, um, sexually targeted. Um, so what happens here is that they are targeted by the same prison industrial complex that they're striving to protect their children from. So in a way, you could say they're doubly targeted by uh, the prison industrial complex. And so uh, scholars like Alicia Bieria and, and other Black feminist abolitionist scholars have been saying all along that the problem of prisons extends far beyond prison walls. Ruthie Gilmore says, especially since households stretch from neighborhoods to visiting rooms to courtrooms with a consequent thinning of financial and emotional resources. And that's exactly what we have seen which explains why we refer to the people who are mothering incarcerated people as survivors of the prison industrial complex and reproductive injustice in their own right. So if you think of Mary L. Johnson, you know, one of the known mothers of, you know, Chicago police torture survivor Michael Johnson, she stated, as long as my son is doing life, I'm a lifer. So as survivors, the mental and physical health and economic realities of mother survivors have been devastated by the torture and incarceration of their loved ones. So I, I know the time is short, so I'll just point to a couple themes that have come out of the project. So one of them is that, um, one of the themes I wanna get to is that, well, when you think about, these are folks who have been in and out of court for many of them like 20 years, their life, you know, going in and out of court is a way of life. So for decades, the courts in Illinois, and so what I wanna uplift now in this next point that I wanna make is about what does care work actually look like when you're caring for someone who's incarcerated? So the courts in Illinois dismiss, have always dismissed survivors' allegations of torture. And that's a long story that I won't have time to get into about you know, Chicago being the United States capital of police torture, as well as the history of the movement for reparations. Um, but one of the things that, you know, we can pay attention to is just that right now the Torture Inquiry and Relief Commission, which is an agency put in place to provide torture survivors with an avenue to have their claims heard in court, has a backlog of over 500 cases. Um, so when we think about that, you know, all those people remain incarcerated. So it's a way of life to have to deal with the criminal justice system when you're put in that situation. So one strategy through which mothers of the kidnapped, you know, fight back is that they enact collective ways of being through knowledge sharing. So at the mercies of the courts excluded from access to legal aid and information about the law and excluded from professional networks that connect that could connect them to the resources of the criminal justice system, they are forced into a position of combining sharing knowledge with each other as a practice of collective care and as a politics of resistance. So what I'm getting at is that their care work, the way they care for each other is wrapped up in their activism and their fight for justice. They're, they're, it's not care work and activism. So if we think of Bertha Escamilla, she's the son of torture survivor Nick Escamilla. She was um, she collects data on the cases of Chicago's torture survivors, including the cops whose violence is not yet publicly known. Um, and she, you know, tries to figure out well who can who might qualify for having their case investigated. Um, so many people rely on Bertha's data. Lawyers rely on it. Other family members rely on it. Incarcerated people rely on it social movements rely on it. I'm not gonna keep the slide up for long, but it this is what activists were able, and in the work that I do, were able to create out of Bertha's research. This is a log of all the torture survivors under uh, who were tortured by a certain set of police officers. 
And so that's just an example of the that labor that is happening and that she's not what, just fighting for her own son. She's collecting data and sharing it out about the courthouses, about you know why we all need to show up. Um, so she says, we're put into this situation where we don't have any knowledge about what we're supposed to do. We are factory workers or just driving a bus. We encourage other mothers to look for things pertaining to their case so they know what to ask. We do this for all the families. Now I wanna get at another point about how caring for um, incarcerated people involves, extends far beyond the individual and far beyond biology to include extended relatives, friends, and neighbors as central actors in collective mothering and caretaking. Armanda Shackelford here on the right of this uh, mother of torture survivor Gerald Reed describes how her work against state violence will continue long after her son Gerald is released from prison. So she says Gerald's not in there by himself. There are others locked up. And she's basically saying that when Gerald gets out, my fight is not over. My fight is just beginning. And then there's stories and stories of friends and family members who love the, the children of these mothers just as much as they do. So this woman, Kathy, who mothers her friend's son, says, the thing is, I love him too now. I have my own personal relationship with him. And so what we're seeing then is that mothers of the kidnapped reject narrowly conceived definitions of family, and they take collective responsibility for each other's children, for caring and demanding justice all at once. And so if the aim of abolition is to build another better society, then we need a renewed commitment to horizontal politics, collective labor, and recognizing the often invisible and highly gendered forms of work that enable social movements to survive and thrive. And I wanted to uplift that Elisa Bieria has been one of the key thinkers in the United States about themes like community accountability, Themes like, you know, why we shouldn't call the cops in cases of domestic violence. So these are all key ideas that underpinned a lot of the thinking that we're seeing today, now, decades later, when people talk about, you know, abolitionist feminism or care work in relation to police violence, etc. Um, and so uh, one thing we have learned again and again from contexts like uh, the uh, from Standing Rock, from Tahrir Square, from the women's collective cooperatives during the first Intifada in Palestine, is that protests against militarized state violence require care work if the movement or the revolution is going to survive. And indeed, we are um, going to need radical mothering um, as a strategy. We're going to need to insist, especially if we're fighting over elections if we're fighting over surviving fires or water or land, when we need to insist that no one takes for granted any longer the care work that and the urgently collective ways of being in the world that mothers of the kidnapped are uplifting. So in conclusion, uh, I want to ask that we consider the radical potential of mothering um, and also that we recognize the ways heteropatriarchal concepts shape state violence and they also shape revolution and resistance and the possibilities. And so what, I, what I'm getting at here are how if we actually look at care work and the labor of radical mothering, it actually opens up new possibilities for thinking about both disrupting heteropatriarchal gender norms and also disrupting authoritarianism, uh, colonialist nation states, and the carceral state. What I mean by that is if we go back to the images from Tahrir Square, if we go back to the images from Tahrir Square from you know, Egyptian women, Egyptian folks doing the labor of mothering and resistance, what I found there and what I found is in Chicago is that it is in that space between the domestic and the streets where radical mothering lives. And it is in those spaces where, and it is in that, and it is that very binary of the public and private, or you know, the, the good mother and the male hero in the streets, 
So it, in that space in between where radical mothering lives, that it that constitutes the radical potential of mothering, the potential of radical mothering to disrupt heteropatriarchal nationalist, you know, um, social uh, forms uh, that structure our societies, and also then the potential to dismantle those structures altogether um, and those systems. So then we can think and ask ourselves, who are the agents of abolition and decolonization um, that we value? What are the relations of not just protest, but care needed to sustain resistance, love and community for the long haul? Indeed, any future we are trying to imagine needs radical mothering in all of its forms if we are going to survive. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> that was really, that was really incredible. Uh, thank you so much, Nadine. It's such a pleasure to listen to you uh, talk and to listen to you analyze and talk about the, the, the just incredible and powerful work that you've been doing all these years. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, I'm Elisa Bieria and um, I'm gonna be um, facilitating a conversation with Nadine. Just wanna give you a heads up, um, everyone out there about the schedule. So um, we will have a conversation between me and Nadine till about 4.30 Pacific, 7.30 Eastern. And then we'll open it up to, um, for the next 15 minutes to everyone who has joined us. Um, if you'd like, you can go ahead and start putting your questions in the Q&A. Um, on Zoom. And let's see. I also just want to do a, a brief shout out to Sarah and Cooper and Tiffany. Thank you so much for the beautiful way that you've organized this event. I'm so grateful for that. Um, okay, I think I'm just going to jump in. Um, so Nadine, oh my God, you just took us down such a, a, a interesting road um, uh, from Tahrir Square to Chicago. I really love the ways in which you juxtaposed how mothers um, were getting constructed, distorted, constructed in the context of the revolution, um, where you know you have folks who are counter protests, pro state who are reconstructing mothers and women who are protesting as sexually deviant. And you have mothers being constructed and distorted um, from, by the left um, as oxymorons, right? Oxymoronic, right? Mothers in protest. So those are your two options. You can either be sexually deviant or oxymoronic, right? Um, but in that, in in the in the context of that that transgressiveness, right? Um, you described how um, mothering can unfold in the context of revolution. Um, both as practice, but also ex as praxis, as something that has um, that's grounded in very particular political principles, and also as an organizing methodology, which is something that I got most clearly when you moved to Chicago, um, when you talked about the mothers of police torture and what mothering looks like in these profound conditions of carceral terror, um, you know. Uh, and what care looks like in the context of mothering in the context of that terror, right? And, you know, care can look like, um, you know, care labor as data collection, right? So a kind of really intentional way of shifting um, epistemic, like what we know and epistemic possibility, right? So care, re reconceptualizing care as learning. Um, but also as um, as world making, right? As an as an epistemic um, uh, insurrection, right? And then you talked about um, care as community building, but it was more than that. I was trying to come up with a better phrase because it was more than community building. It was it was like um, uh, this way of building very intentional connections as a way to um, continue that educational work but to build the movement that you need to build and to make those connections really meaningful. So there's something there about the, the quality of the connections, not just the quantity, right? Um, which I think is uh, what makes care so important. Cause you know, the whole point of community organizing is to, is to build, right, a movement, but there's something about care as a methodology that transforms the qualitative nature of that building. 
So, I mean, I could just, I don't know. I, I, uh, I just, I, I have some specific questions, but let me just pause here to see if you have um, anything else that you'd like to add before I, before I do that. Same. I mean, I'm just thinking about everything you said. I, yeah. I, I really appreciated the, um, you know, the, the knowledge part, because there's something there that I find really, really important about, about the car, what you said, carceral terror. Is that what you said? About mm -hmm. part of carceral terror is um, denying people knowledge, you know, in this case. Um, knowledge is at the table all the time, meaning like right now with COVID, it's like, you know, no one knows anything of what's happening inside. You know, the, 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 their grown children don't know what's happening outside about COVID and the rates and who has it, who doesn't. Um, so that it's just constant of like, we don't know, we, we, we don't. And then, it, and then if someone like now we have one of the sons is actually on their last days of life, you know, and we're trying to get them home to be with their mother and family. Um, and in that situation, they, um, they, uh, you know, if you say, what can we do? People will say, I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. like the mm -hmm. only people you can go to are other family members. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's just like, that's who they have. Like they know that each other is who they have. Um, and, and, and there's also a issue of isolation, you know, like all of them talk all the time about being isolated from former friends, from relatives, from neighbors, and nobody believes them um, that, you know, that their children were actually tortured. And you go to the protest, people will drive by and, and say, what? You know, these people were are falsely convicted. Yeah, right. You know, and so and this happens to them like every day of their lives, you know. So there's just like this weird thing around what you're saying about knowledge, you know, being mm -hmm. just misused and and uh, yeah, used as a means of control. That's right. Containment. So it transforms. I'm sorry. Oh, and containment and containment. Yes. That's absolutely right. Because there's a way in which carceral power very intentionally controls information, contains information, like literally with a cage, right? Um, and, um, and therefore controls what gets to be understood as common sense, right? And so if you hold a sign on the corner that says, you know, the police have been torturing my child, my son, um, and then someone drives by and says, I don't believe you it's you know that just that's a window into like the the level of epistemic push that is in front of us right but you're also saying that um as an epistemic method mm -hmm. uh care can be very powerful um yeah and i mean i've, I've seen i i am um, so excited about been, this <laughs> yeah <laughs> well because i was i was thinking about mutual aid too in the context of prison visiting and I was like, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out what about that relationship is, is mutual given the, the power differentiation. And I think that the thing that, um, that creates a kind of um, mutual care and, and relationality is, is learning, right? It's learning. It's, um, it's learning information. It's the gift of, of, um, of, uh, of having that sort of, uh, you know, state, you know, kind of glasses or, you know what I mean? Lenses just taken off, right? And so that I can understand, even if I understand intellectually carceral violence, to understand it more viscerally is just a different kind of knowing, right? And which I think is also something so uh, potent about the way that you're describing care as a, uh, not just a, um, an epistemic tool or even a methodology, it's that it, um, it connects to people in this way that is just um, more lasting than an article, right? Or, you know what I mean? Or a lecture. Um, so it's just such a, um, a powerful and under, under, under um, 
studied kind of or underappreciated kind of um, pedagogy, I would say, based that. on your on your talk. I love that so much. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Well, let me let me um, let me complicate it a little bit, right? Because this is another thing that's been in the mix. So, uh, as 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 you know, and I think as you as you mentioned in your talk, care is a vexed concept for feminists, especially for feminists of color, right? Um, and some have raised um, flags of caution for care work at, in the context of mutual aid and transformative justice and other kinds of abolition, feminist abolitionist methodologies because it's largely labor that becomes feminized and then expected of women and femmes. Like it's not, it's feminized, which I don't actually have a problem with except, <laughs> except that, um, uh, that the way that when it becomes feminized, that means it's not considered important. So that's one, um, or political, so, right? Okay. And then the other thing is when it's taken for granted because women and femmes are taken for granted. So I'm wondering how your political and pedagogical work um, in the community and in both of these sites, the Tahrir Square in Chicago sort of challenge that tension. Yeah, I love that so much. Um... Well, that's such a great question because that's something I'm trying to figure out how to talk about all of us are around, I mean, I think what we want to say is that, and what we hope one of the interventions is here is that it's not, and I know that when people write about care work, they mean this, but I feel like it needs to be said more explicitly that what we're saying when we talk about care work and abolition, for example, or care work and you know the Egyptian revolution with this theme of like radical mothering at least um, that it's not that that care work is part of resistance work mm -hmm. meaning that it's it is revolutionary labor and not and that doesn't mean that care work by itself should be defined as revolutionary labor but that care work and the other forms of labor often defined as revolutionary labor, like protesting, speaking, uh, whatever things like making big decisions about the future vision of the movement or all these things that, you know, are mass seen as like masculinized forms of movement labor. But I think the point is that, and maybe I'm not sure how to say it clearly that what's radical about this radical mothering is that it involves both. So that it's the, it's the caring works um, permeably, is that a word? The care work and the resistance work are permeable, mm -hmm. right? So in the same moment that someone is getting this piece of knowledge to their friend, that's the care work that we just talked about, right? Like, oh, you should know that you can go to court tomorrow to fill out this paper. While they're doing that, they're also um, like going after the governor. And um, I mean, I didn't have time to go into it. I have a, a very short video, if you wanted to see it, that shows the voices of these mothers of the kidnapped, you know, that they are out there in the streets demanding justice mm -hmm. and they no holds bar. I mean, they are just on the front lines, you know? So I think that that's really important that, but what they show us is that that work cannot be successful without the care work and the care work can't be successful without the front lines, whatever, I don't know what the word would be to not make it masculine again, <laughs> you know, without the, those other forms of like conventional forms of labor we usually think of as political. So that it's, there has to be a word to say that it's all one thing, like that. that is the radical movement labor, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it has to have both mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. dealing with this particular issue, at least. Right. So, okay. So it's, not, and this goes to the end of your talk around the, the living in the, in the, the intersections of the domestic and the streets, right? So when you say permeable, do you mean, um, uh, it creates a kind of way for the work to move like water? Oh, what is that I mean, what you mean? That's a good question. Uh, maybe going back to what you said about the, so care work is seen as, uh, is feminized and seen as work that quote unquote women do. 
-hmm. like that's a problem, right? Um, right? Because then it becomes invisible and it also reinforces heteropatriarchy because it reduces women to their reproductive like assumptions about their reproductive capacity. Like the reason mm -hmm. why it's feminized is because women are seen to be, you know, to reproduce. Um, and so then, so that's just a mess because we don't want that reduction, right? And so, um, so as far as this question about the, because the radical mothering challenges that, mm -hmm. because radical mothering still does mothering, it still does care work, things that are conventionally defined as you know, feminized, mm -hmm. but it doesn't do it in a way that um, relies on a public private binary. Right. It does it right. in a way that blurs that binary. So like in the Egypt case, the the fact that mothering were like in Tahrir Square while getting childcare at home, while going back to Tahrir Square, they're at home doing social media, getting the internet for their comrades in Tahrir. So, so what's happening is that their mothering labor was intertwined with like street labor, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was, mm -hmm. they, they didn't have to think, oh, I have to decide whether I'm gonna go to Tahrir Square because I'm with my kid. They were in Tahrir Square, like they had been there before they had kids, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it is like almost a, yeah, that's what I mean by permeable that the, resistance work and the mothering and the care work are all intertwined. Yeah. It's not like and, I'm going to do my mothering work and then I'm going to do my activist work. Yeah. Yeah, no, I get it. I, but I also hear you saying not only is it intertwined, but it intertwines. It's intertwining. Yeah. Right. And, and that's so the radical it's potential. That's right. That's the radical potential. And I think that's the the intertwining work that um, that mothering is doing is uh, is is getting to maybe that's the term that we could use for now that sort of holistic term that you were talking about. It's got to happen both. It's got to happen in the streets and in the home. It's got to be on the front lines, and it's got to be in these more um, uh, you know localized spaces, right? And so you know maybe it's the intertwining that. Uh, that sort of gets to um, that kind of disruption of, of, of borders, right? right? right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. especially because the regime in Egypt and the U.S. rely on that binary. That's mm -hmm. like what sustains the U.S. nation state is this idea of the home, the mother, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, Brilliant. <laughs> you um, know what? Yeah, one, my favorite part in the Egypt research is the part about Tahrir Square when everyone in the square was doing mothering labor. Mm -hmm. And that's like the expansive possibility of it. That, Can you describe what that looked like? Meaning that like um, everybody in the streets had to feed each other, find blankets, um, care for each other, um, all the things that are conventionally defined as like women's work. Mm -hmm. but the whole Tahrir Square did it together, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so that is in that moment, even though it was 18 days, I mean, everyone who writes about being there says it was a utopia. They use the mm -hmm. word utopia um, because it was, you know, people said there was, they, they, you know, they had, I mean, people said that this is the first time they never experienced sexual harassment. This was the first time, you know, so it was like, it was just a moment to be able to think about what happens when mothering labor isn't feminized. Right, know? right. Well, let me, let me ask you one more question and I'll move it to Q&A. But the, um, I'm wondering about the, as another complicated space, um, I'm wondering about the classroom. And I'm wondering if your um, ideas about care can translate into your pedagogical work in the context of the classroom. Um, because, you know, I, I, if you are teaching classes on gender violence, what you what you will see is a disproportionate number of survivors, right? And so now you have this really interesting situation where you have, um, where you're, you're thinking carefully about survivors as intellectuals and 
pedagogy, you know, is it becomes complicated, um, but I think richer. So, you know, I, you know, when I, when I talk, when I think about um, black women academics, one of the things that they, that they are very careful about is to not be reconstructed by their students as mammy figures. And, you know, there's a way in which the care can become, um, you know, uh, exploitative and racist, right? But I also, so that's, so that's just a thing that's just there. <laughs> this is part of attention, right? And I'm tr I've been also trying to figure out, okay, but how do you maintain a productive boundary for a productive for everybody while also disrupting that kind of Cartesian, you know, um, expectation of only mind, never body, never heart as part of an educational experience. And so, and, and, and care is part of that, that I think um, challenge to that sort of wow. weird Cartesian split. And so I'm wondering if your ideas about care has, have ever emerged in the context of your classroom. Wow, that's so powerful. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually thinking a lot about this. I haven't formulated my thoughts yet, so I, I don't know how much I have to say other than what I have been thinking about is just about, you know, it's it's not directly to answer your question, but it's obviously around the, you know, women and queer and transgender people of color in the academic industrial complex and all the care work that falls on our shoulders, right? Yeah, because the institution right. doesn't do its job and there's no accountability in academia. And so, it's just like a really rich environment for <laughs> people of color in general to be, especially women and queer and transgender people to be the, you know, the care staff and faculty to be the people who care mm -hmm. um, for younger people, students, especially who are, have like a similar, whatever history or identity or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I think about it a lot, I think, I mean, this is just such a more like a simplistic answer, but I think that one of the problems is that we just don't talk about this enough. You know, like it's right. such a silenced issue. Like if there's so much, um, there's so much silence, you know, in academia because in order to maintain the academic industrial complex, right? We all have to act like we are succeeding at these jobs and climbing the ladder and, um, and any time anything that any problem or challenge we're having just reinforces the idea of being, uh, you know, the the narrative that we are all frauds or imposters or don't belong here, um, you know, or our own fear that we're participating in violence by being there in the first place, by being part of this elitist industrial complex. So. You know, we already have all these anxieties because of the institution, you know, creates them. And then what do you do then? You're in it and you are trying to support people. So my approach lately is to just say it all out loud. You know, like I talk to my undergrads, I talk to my grad students, I talk to junior faculty, I talk to my staff, if I have staff, you know, that like I'm a woman of color in academia, I'm a full professor, but I'm also positioned in this way in the institution. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is, these are the things that, you know, happened along the way <laughs> to me mm -hmm. or not as a victim, but as a collective struggle, you know? Yeah. And so, and I'm starting to really talk and think a lot about what we used to talk about a long time ago, abolishing the academic industrial complex. Like, you know, where did that concept go? <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's bring mm -hmm. it back. <laughs> Let's bring it back. <laughs> like, how do we, yeah. You know, we're, we're going to have to, I don't know. So that's just really what I would say. Just that well, it's, it's so toxic and so violent and it does do this thing, you know, where how, how do you care for other people without, if your own nest is broken, you right. know, like if you're broken and then you're expected to care for everybody, that, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It, but I but I also think that your organizing might have some light for us in terms of how to navigate through some of this. Um, one of one of the lessons from the work in Chicago is the way in which mothering kind of 
it doesn't it doesn't just I like locate care in that individual mother through the connections that's made through the mothering through the care care becomes more democratized right mm -hmm. more kind of um, the responsibility of everyone involved yes. right and so there's something very interesting about that and I wonder I think that there might be ways to translate that as a methodology in the classroom mm -hmm. and so I've talked to I'm I um, I'd like to get better at this as a teacher I haven't figured it out but the I've spoken to other faculty members who figured out how to like facilitate the students to care for each other in the context of the pandemic, right? It's, really cool. it's uh, you know what I mean? And so I think that there's a resonance between um, that move to um, to sort of spread the care labor around. Ah, I love uh, that. With um, with the with the um, the innovations that's happening with the, your group in Chicago. One of the ways that get that I think that I love that. I'm gonna I'm gonna use that for sure in my classes. I one of the things I've been I have been talking about is with grad students of color, activist students, um, to really think about their dissertations outside of the academic structure. So like, yeah, you have a committee, but it doesn't mean you can't talk to other people or that, you know, there's so many people we could all be mentoring each other. So also just thinking about these structures of like committees and departments and, you know, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be, oh, I can't ask you because you're not on my committee or, you know, just to mm -hmm. think of like, what if we just existed outside of this institution and you just had this really cool project, like who are the people you would talk to, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that that kind of, that even though, even these kind of small disruptions, right, in terms of just the way that we are creating relationality and that work, you should be talking to everybody about your dissertation, You're, you know, uh, exactly. you know, like just get it out there and talk exactly. to people about it, right? Um, I think that that might be some, um, I think that might be some initial abolitionist moves, <laughs> you know, call me crazy, I'm just saying. <laughs> I, am I am with you so much okay. on this. I love it. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna move to the to the the um, the people. Um, we've got a lot of questions here. Let me give me just a second so I can read through. Um, sorry, there's so much here. Well, there, okay, so there are big questions and there are, there are very specific questions. So let me just get to the specific questions first. Um, Emma Williams asks, how can Chicago residents get involved with mamas? Oh, we would love to have you get involved. Email, <laughs> you can go to our website, motheringisradical.com. And go. Um, I think our email is motheringisradical at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> but you can just email us through the website. Mm -hmm. um, an anonymous says the assignments for your course sound so interesting. Could you talk more about what they entail for students? Um, I'm not sure which course, but really quick, the email is motheringisradical at gmail.com. So please do email us. Okay. We have internship opportunities and different ways to get involved. Oh, and, and then, then um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, oh yeah, the course is just. Um, I hope I remember, but um, we have a can There's a campaign. Um, there are campaign uh, projects that the students do. They pick up one of these themes, like the themes you saw here, around immigration, reproductive justice, prisons. Um, indigenous struggle, um, Palestine, different struggles. And they come up with like a, a kind of like a campaign for campus using a feminist or queer of color lens. Um, and then students just work in groups on the different topics and they work on it all semester. So that's, and they have to create materials like pamphlets and leaflets types of things. Mm -hmm. and. Um, mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to ask a question from Brianna Simmons. Um, 
Brianna asks, I'm also thinking about these pedagogies of radical mobilization and the kinds of ceremonies we need to speak to these questions and needs, ceremonies. I agree that mothering and care live and coalesce in these liminal spaces, like you're saying, Nadine, um, and practicing bridge work, connecting people in spaces are you witnessing that sustaining this under common, these under common spaces for otherwise care, right? That's an interesting concept. It's otherwise care, right? Um, depends on the collapsibility and mobility of these liminal spaces. Okay, let me read that again. In practicing bridge work, connecting people in spaces, are you witnessing that sustaining this under common space for otherwise care depends on the collapsibility and mobility of these liminal spaces? Or do you believe that a kind of permanence or grounding is fundamental to care work and revolutionary praxis? In the context of your care work, what are signs that grounding is needed? So what I, what I hear you saying, Brianna, is um, in terms of the Are you witnessing that sustaining this, this undercommon space for otherwise care depends on the collapsibility and mobility of these liminal spaces? Um, I th think one thing that I'm hearing in the question is uh, um, how much stability is required for this kind of organizing, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, right, in these spaces, like, for example, I, I'm, and I'm, I may be misinterpreting the question, so I apologize if so. But for example, in the context of Tahrir Square where there's mothering um, happening in these really interesting ways that are kind of like build it as you go, right? <laughs> like figure it out as you go. Um, we just have to be here. We're trying to overthrow the government and whatnot. Um, and, then, and then you leave. So it's not it's, it doesn't sound like it was necessarily people were building kind of sustainable institutions in the middle of the square in the context of the revolution, but you're building different kinds of relations um, that are um, temporary, in the, that, but necessary in the moment. And what I hear in Brianna's question is, um, you know, is there, do, you know, are there, are there, is there thinking about the mobility or the permanence or the grounding, like how grounded does some of those spaces, the the disruption of the the public and the private needs need mm. to be. Does that yeah. you feel me? Yeah, not so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are that's a great question. I mean, it's kind of funny because I have one example from Egypt that has a opposite result as the example in Chicago. So in Egypt, the I struggled a lot with the material about the these folks who were they were movement people before they had children. So it wasn't that they the the it wasn't that having children is what mobilized them to be activists like how we usually think of radical mothering is that like mother of the martyrs or mothers of the disappeared or you know and so this was where people were already you know in movement and so then what when they had kids and then they were also supporting and doing care work for their friends with kids um okay or their neighbors around like, who's gonna go down to Tahrir Square today. It was like this, it, it didn't require grounding because it was a crisis, you know? And, right. um, you know, it was like a state of emergency situation where people were just, you know, getting tear gassed and having, getting run over by, you know, motorcycles and camels, you know, and military equipment. And so they were like, and they knew that they had to go to Tahrir Square or the, the revolution wouldn't survive, that they had to fill the square on the most dangerous days because that was when people weren't gonna go, you know? Um, and so in that sense, the, you know, the, the mothering that they brought, you know, even if they weren't with their kids, but that, that was happening around all these things was really fluid. And I, I still, I knew there was something there still about mothering. Um, and it was that impromptu that I mm -hmm. found interesting, which I'm not gonna get into now. But then in yeah. Chicago, um, this, this struggle has been going on for many of these folks for, like I said, decades. 
Um, and so it's, it's really traumatizing. And, you know, we meet once a week um, and we, you know, we, we also do healing work. Right. And so it, it would definitely requires, and I didn't mention that, you know, in the talk, but there's a, obviously a, a lot of trauma there, you know, and the work cannot move without holding space that's grounded for mm -hmm. people to have a space to process their emotions and get whatever support they need for what they're going through each week. Right. Well, it's a different temporality too, yeah. right? For the two spaces. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it could be that the, that the care work is going to need to be less impromptu in the context of Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, so then what I hear you saying is that this framework that you're proposing is multi-temporal, multi-rhythmic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and let's see, thank you so much, Brianna. Um, let's see. We've got several questions about like just raising some um, concerns about, about gender. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to, um, um, I know we've already, we've sort of, we've, we've begun to address it, but I'm going to ask these questions. Uh, Preeti Narayan, I'm sorry if I mispronounced, um, is there a danger of furthering gendering care work by bringing it under the umbrella term of mothering? This is a great question because it's, yeah, why, why do we need to do mothering, right? So they say, what work does the term mothering do that care work or life's work or even social reproduction doesn't do? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. I mean, really my answer, I struggle with this so much. I think about it every single day, but because this is not, it's a project led by movement um, and we're working with people who identify as mothers and for them it's mothering, you know? And so we do our best to, you know, our definition of mothering is expansive. Um, you know, we work and do queer mothering. Um, and so, I mean, and I think I partly also, feel like care work is broader or social reproduction is broader. And we are talking about people in relation to children, which doesn't mean that it has to be reduced to biology. Um, and so there's something there. It, so I, I think about it as a specific kind of care work. Um, and I, I do agree that it could be a, a different word could be used to talk about care work in relation to children. Um, of course, um, absolutely, uh, social reproduction even. Um, but the concept of mothering is really powerful for people who feel that they have had their ability to care for children taken away by the state, whether it's their biological children or not. Um, so it's kind of like, um, yeah, that's the context of the work is that it is people in community and communities at large and neighborhoods at large that have been denied the, you know, what the ability to like protect the children of their people, you know, or youth um, and just be able to have, uh, I don't know what the word would be, relations with um, healthy relations with young people um, but especially people who are mothers, you know, of those children and that th they are at the center of our work, biological or not. Yeah. So there's something I'm important. Open, yeah. about I'm super open. I'm not like hardline about it. It's just no. that it is yeah. the concept of mothering that brings people to the project. Um, and it creates a sense of like, you know, unity and, um, and, and as we keep the concept expansive, we, we have, you know, biological and non-biological folks at the table um, who find it a space that they can feel at home and part of the, at the center, whether biological or not. Yeah. I mean, I think that 
I, I wonder, I wonder if um, it's, if it's, it's not just the positionality in terms of care that makes, or, I'm sorry, mother, motherhood that, um, that gives mothering, uh, you know, power, like makes it necessary to use the word mothering, right? But also that the, the, the kind of violence, particularly in Chicago, is such a particular, like, um, such a particular violence against mothering. Um, you know, of course, it's against people. So, and but there, but it sounds like what what's happening is that those mothers are coming to the table of this organization of this movement work um, because something happened to their child, and so and thus something happened to them because there's that that relationship has been deeply and profoundly um, violated through this state violence, right? And so I think that there's something about um, mothering that defines the violence that they are yeah. um, resisting, as well as the political methodology that shapes the, um, the organizing that y'all have been doing. Does that resonate with you? It does. Yeah. I wonder what uh, Preeti thinks. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much for the yeah. question. Thank you, Preeti. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, I'll just ask one more. We've got two more minutes. Um, Natalie L. Eid, I'm so sorry if I mispronounce. Um, Natalie asks, does radical mothering look different across different racial groups, geographical spaces, classes, genders, and sexualities? And if so, how can we attend to these differences? Like, I think it's so wonderful that you're bringing to, you're bringing Tahrir and Chicago into conversation, radically different contexts, right? But mothers who are, who are um, politicized and radicalized and in the, in the midst, right? And so I'm, it's a great question, like what are the differences or, and do those differences make a difference? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a great question. I mean, if we talk about Palestine, you know, the body of people perceived to be mothers have always been a site of colonization, um, whether it's, you know, um, targeting, you know, women's bodies by the, um, you know, Israeli settler colonizers, or many of you probably already know, stopping, um, pregnant women at checkpoints and blocking them from getting to uh, medical facilities so they can give birth. Um, and then another really big one is that isn't talked about as much is um, political prisoners, women political prisoners in Israeli jails who um, Oh dear, I'm not sure if what? my internet stopped or your internet stopped. Oh, there it is. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. You paused. I'm sorry. Oh, Keep going. Okay. Oh, about the political prisoners. What's complicated about that is, um, so, okay, you know, Orient I don't know who's at the audience. That's what's so weird about these Zoom events, but mm -hmm. so Orientalism and anti-Arab racism relies on concepts about Arab culture that assume that Arab culture is hyper homophobic and sexist, right? Um, and so you have these concepts like in Arab culture, they're Arab culture values like honor and shame, right? So that's like a racist discourse that's used as to justify colonization. So in when torture happens in an Israeli jail, the torturers rely on these concepts to justify the forms of torture they will use. And I'm sorry, trigger warning big time. But like, you know, when Rasmi Aude was tortured, they used ideas about like bringing her father into the room um, in relation to sexual torture. So in those situations, what's happening is they're relying on Orientalist ideas about Arab families, right. like racist ideas that the family is this way. So the most brutal thing you could do to an Arab is shame a woman in front of her father, right? Um, so all that to say that when we think about, you know, so then K 
communities can respond, any community would respond by intensifying heteropatriarchal control of you know, women's bodies to protect them, quote unquote, from the Israeli state, knowing that this is what happens if you are a woman activist. Um, and there's a whole nother thing I could say about queer people and trans activists within this story. But just to say that, so whatever, I guess what I'm saying is like the form of state violence that targets quote unquote motherhood yeah. inspires the kinds of mothering that is becomes like idealized in that community, if that makes sense. Perfect sense, perfect sense. Nadine, um, this has been so brilliant. Thank you so much again for your, your just wonderful leadership. Um, thank you to your organization for the incredible revolutionary work. Your intellectual creativity, um, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for coming to the event. I'm gonna pass the baton over to Sarah. Hello. Hello, I just wanted to say thank you both so much um, from the lecture at the top and going into that discussion. It was so rich and there's so much to take away from. And if this is a part two, um, we have such a juicy center and I wanna thank you for giving us that and being so generous. Um, and I also wanted to highlight that really this discussion really shows the power of you two um, feminists who have been working together and building coalitions and doing this work transnationally. And if we're, if this entire series is focusing on building solidarities, I think we saw the power of that tonight. So I wanna thank you so much and thank you for bringing us into the potential of radical mothering and what is possible. Um, I wanted to also invite everyone to our final event of this series. Um, it is an event featuring Dr. Scott Kurashige, who will be giving a lecture, um, Representation to Revolution, What Asian American Studies Can Teach Us About Systems of Oppression. And then following his lecture, he will be in conversation with Adrian Marine Brown. So, that's that. And I wanted again, thank you, Nadine and Elisa for everything and um, for just blessing us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.